করতে হবে রেকর্ডিং হচ্ছে তো ইয়ে হচ্ছে না স্টপ শেয়ার is it fine now yeah and recording is also starting okay so it's a great pleasure uh, to have all of you and to be uh, deeply smoked to the faculty and uh, our speaker today is uh, Dr. Devanjan Ghosh from the city of Kuriyas Ghosh did his Bachelor of Science from Public Service College in Kuriyas and then he did his Masters from the Bible Science College and then he did his PhD from Kuriyas in 2007 and after that he holds his doctorate in Spain ডিসকভার 
exactly 110 years ago. It was the time when people were studying radiation, uh, radioactivity, and it was the idea people had that radiation is something, it's earthly phenomena, its source is on earth. So in order to prove that, people, many scientists, they uh, did experiments, and Victor Hayes took some initiative. He made the balloon flight. The idea was, if you go higher up in the atmosphere, you will see less radiation if radiation is coming from elements in earth. So he made balloon flights, but then to his surprise, he noticed when he reached an altitude of five kilometers, radiation started increasing. Then it was here, it's not coming from earth, it was coming from outside. Okay. So then people said maybe it's sun which is producing the radiation. So he repeated the experiment when during the solar eclipse and still he brought radiation. He detected radiation, so it was clear the radiation he was getting, it's beyond our solar system and for that he got Nobel Prize. So since then <clears throat> many experiments were conducted to measure cosmic rays and this is the spectrum <clears throat> that uh, measured. So what we know now about cosmic rays, they are isotropic, meaning no matter where we are on Earth, in Calcutta, New York, Melbourne, we should measure equal amount of cosmic rays per unit area per unit time. Then they cannot penetrate atmosphere. Atmosphere is okay. Okay. So if you want to catch uh, cosmic rays directly, then you should send your detectors in space. And if you want to measure them on ground, then you can do that by detecting these secondary particles and photons, which are produced when cosmic rays interact in the atmosphere. But <clears throat> how to design an experiment? So that idea we can get from this spectrum. Spectrum meaning you have the energy in the x-axis and number of cosmic ray particles detected okay, for the different energy range. Now, if you see at lower energies, you have one particle per meter square per second, meaning your detector size can be of meter square and you can detect cosmic rays. So meaning at these energies, you can send your detectors in space and you detect cosmic rays directly. And if you detect correct, directly, then you know what is their composition. So we know that they're mostly protons. Okay, and some higher nuclei up to iron. But at these energies, you cannot detect them in space because you cannot send a detector of uh, uh, like kilometer square or like in that size in space. It's not possible. So you have to detect them indirectly on ground. Okay, I'll come to that for detection later. Now, next is from where they are coming. Okay. Till date, we do not know from where they come. The reason is, since they are charged particles, proton or any million nuclei, so when they travel in space, they get deflected. So when they, when we detect a cosmic ray, they will point back somewhere else, not to their source. Okay. So in order to identify the source, we need some either neutral particle like neutrino or some gamma rays. Okay. So it is believed that in some sources, uh, some like if this source is producing cosmic rays, then some proton will escape and we detect them as cosmic ray, and some will interact with the matter and they will produce gamma rays and neutrinos. Okay, so if we detect gamma rays and neutrinos, since they're neutral, we can identify the source and we know what are the sources of cosmic rays. Now, there are certain mysteries like why we have so few cosmic rays at such high energy. So, suppose we have one arc of energy, which is roughly 1 10 to the power 12 electron volt. If I tell you, you make some light quanta, light quanta will have energy 1 electron volt, you can make this many photons. And if I tell you, you make 1 tera electron volt gamma ray, you can have only 1 photon. This is something you can easily imagine, like there are more mosquitoes compared to number of electrons, right? This is fine. But this is most interesting. Suppose consider one cosmic ray, which has an energy 10 to the power 20 electron volt, which has been detected. So they exist, we know. 10 to the power 20 electron volt means 20 joules of energy. So how much energy is that? So if you serve a tennis ball, and if the tennis ball moves with a speed of 100 km per hour, the tennis ball will have this much energy. That we can imagine. If the tennis ball hits me, I will be hurt, I will feel pain, it's fine. But a proton, which is so small and so lightweight, how that same proton is getting this much energy? 
that's the most fascinating thing. That's what we'd like to know. Okay. <clears throat> so at lower energies, as I said, we can measure cosmic rays directly in space. So this is the composition. So now by looking at the composition, can we make some guesses like from where these cosmic rays are coming? So if you compare this cosmic ray abundance, this is the black line, and you will see there is a similarity with what we find in solar system. Almost similar except few elements, but this also we can explain that this lithium, beryllium, boron are produced when cosmic ray interact with matter when they travel through space and they produce these elements, which are generally not produced in nucleosynthesis. So from this comparison, we can make a guess that this cosmic ray are produced by star, but not during their main sequence, like when they're doing nucleosynthesis. At the end of their life, when supernova happens, then this matter is thrown out into the interstellar matter, which we detect as a cosmic ray. So that's, we can make a guess from circumstantial evidence that this cosmic ray may be coming from supernova. There is one more reason to believe that cosmic rays uh, are produced by supernova, at least even within our galaxy. Why? Because if you measure the energy density of cosmic ray in our galaxy, which is one electron volt per centimeter cube, and then you compare the volume of the Milky Way and how much energy is there total. So on an average, a cosmic ray, when if it is produced inside the galaxy, they remain trapped for this much time. They get diffused, okay? Because of our galaxy has a certain magnetic field. So in order to maintain this uh, energy density, there should be some source which can produce this much power. Now, if you look at the supernova explosion, how much energy they're producing, and roughly in 100 years, we expect it to get three supernovas in a galaxy. And if they convert even very tiny fraction of its energy, it can maintain this observed cosmic ray. So we have now two reasons to believe that cosmic rays are produced by supernova, at least in our galaxy. But we cannot say with certainty that they do produce because we cannot identify with cosmic rays any supernova. Okay. Yeah, yes. we, have a yeah, yeah. we still have cosmic rays. So does that have any no, that cosmic rays means it's happening, but it's not uh, like some of them may be produced much, much up before or okay. But if the galaxy is up to a certain distance, you can. Otherwise, you cannot identify the supernova. You can only take the galaxy as a source. Okay. If we see a reduction in cost, maybe we can say. So next, how this cosmic rays are accelerated to such high energies. Okay. So there are many theories were proposed, but one thing we have to keep in mind, whatever theory we propose, it must explain this the spectrum that we measure on ground. Okay, it has E minus 2.7 spectrum. So, <clears throat> so this diffusive sub acceleration mechanism is more or less accepted by now. So it's proposed by Fermi. So in this mechanism, what he said, like when supernova happens, let me go back. So, so there is a neutron star formed and this matter is thrown out in the interstellar medium, which moves very rapidly, very fast. It produces a shock wave, okay? It's magnetized. So when this shock wave moves, it shifts through matter and interstellar matter has charged particles, protons and etc. They get trapped in the magnetic field and they, cross this shock wave many, many times. They remain trapped maybe for a thousand years and they gain energy. At some point, they will escape and which we detect as cosmic rays. So if you do the mathematics, you'll see you'll get a particle distribution exactly E minus two. Okay. So escape means if, we, if a charge particle is interacting in a magnetic field, its gyro radius keep on increasing. So at, at some point, the gyro radius of the system will be smaller than the gyro radius of the particle. That's when it is. 
So, but then it is E minus two and what we see is 2.7. So we need to account for this difference as well. So what happens is, for example, in galaxy, question you ask now, it has a three micro Gauss magnetic field. So they'll be trapped and they'll get diffused many, many times because it has escape time very high. And because of this diffusion, what we observe will be what is produced at the source multiplied by this factor. This is the escape time. So escape time of a cosmic ray will be a function of e to the power minus 0. 0.6. So if you multiply this, then we get a spectrum which is very close to this. Okay. So since this mechanism more or less explains this uh, spectrum we observe, so this is what we have accepted as the standard acceleration mechanism. Next, <clears throat> are all cosmic rays are produced by supernova? No. The reason is, if you look at this cosmic ray spectrum, and if we see that our galaxy has a certain magnetic field strength, okay, so meaning, as I said, like uh, charged particle is trapped in the magnetic field, it moves, the range is around this magnetic field, its radius increases. So it can gain up to 24 18 electron volt maximum in our galaxy, not more than that. Meaning this cosmic rays, which has energies around 10 to the power 18, 19, 20, they are coming from outside. Because even if they, they are produced within our galaxy, they will immediately escape before even computing one revolution. Okay. So they are definitely coming from our outside the galaxy. Then what are the other sources? So there must be other sources which are producing cosmic rays that we have to find out. Is there any I mean, you can see at the source, but here it may be producing radiation, but actually when you do this calculation for this method, it takes into account, like there may be synchrotron losses, ionization loss, everything, it, at the energy gain is much more than those losses. So it's proton. Yeah. But there is another factor that the energy then the energy when cosmic day, uh, cosmic day we have detected up to this energy can be about 20 electron volt. But there is nothing here. So what happens? Is it that the mechanism that we discussed they cannot accelerate cosmic rays beyond these energies, or something else is happening? So what is the likely scenario? Is this a proton? Which, if it has energy 10 to the power 20 electron volt, then it's more likely to interact with cosmic microwave background photon, which is there everywhere. It's a really good big bang. So they interact with this CMB photon and they produce pines and pines will decay and produce neutrinos. Okay. So there are many experiments which look for this very ultra high energy neutrinos. These neutrinos have energies. If this is 10 to the power 20, it will have almost 10% of its energy, 10 to the power 19 or so. So far we have not found any uh, this GZK neutrinos, but this is the likely scenario that why we do not see cosmic rays beyond this energy. Now about sources, what other sources can produce such energetic cosmic rays? So this is a very famous plot called Hilda's plot, the uh, Hilda's scientist. So he made this plot in the y-axis, he plotted the magnetic field strength and this is the gyro radius of the source. Then the red line, the sources above this red line can accelerate an iron nuclei up to this energy. And, and sources out of this blue line can accelerate a proton. So that, as I said earlier, like few times, in order to accelerate a charged particle, it should remain confined, okay? So either if the source has very high magnetic field, then the source can be compact. Okay, it can still accelerate. And if the magnetic field strength is not very high, then source should be very extended in order to confine the particle, okay? So then if you look, go back and search in literature, what are the sources? which can be fitted. And these are the likely candidates which may be accelerating cosmic rays. Now, <clears throat> how do we detect cosmic rays on down? I'll just give you one example. Okay. At very high energy. There are many experiments. This Pierre OG experiment, which is currently operating, it's in Argentina. They mainly aim to detect very high energy cosmic rays. Now, when we are designing an experiment, Okay, for cosmic ray detection on ground, what are the things you would like to measure? First of all, what is the energy of the cosmic ray 
okay from which direction it has come and what type of cosmic ray it is is it proton or any heavier nuclei you would like to find out so how to do that so when a cosmic ray first comes top of the atmosphere it will produce secondary particles pions or pions then they will decay produce uh, gamma rays neutrinos neons and many other particles <clears throat> so neons even though they have very short lifetime but because of relativistic dilation because they are all moving relativistically its lifetime increases meaning the neon even if it produced 20 kilometers top in the atmosphere it can reach the ground it can even penetrate few kilometers inside the ground so, so this experiment aims to detect the muons in the air shower this kind of air shower is called extensive air shower okay so for this high energy cosmic ray this shower it spreads over many hundreds of square kilometers meaning you need to put your detectors over a very large area. So this experiment has an area of 3,000 square kilometers. And these black dots are nothing but some water tanks. So what this water tank does, so whenever a charged particle, for example, muon, when it enters the tank in the water, they produce Cherenkov light. Do you know what is Cherenkov light? The Cherenkov light is produced when a charged particle moves with the speed of with the speed which is more than the speed of light in the medium okay and then the cylindrical radiation produce it it produced in the forward direction it can produce in the air as well as in the water so in air it has a very small opening angle in water it has a large opening angle so this kind of cylindrical of light is produced which is optical light by the way so we can detect this optical light using this photomultiplier tubes i'll explain what is a photomultiplier tube later so you <clears throat> measure uh, this photomultiplier tube you can measure how many photons you are detecting and depending on how many tanks are triggered you can estimate how many uh, or, or, or from the arrival time like for example in this shower this tank will get the signal first and this tank will get signal at later time so by recording this arrival time information you can reconstruct this this particle disk and once you reconstruct this particle disk you know from which direction the cosmic ray has come if it is spherical disk and from the number of photons you get number of chain of photons you can estimate what is the energy of the cosmic ray so from this uh, using this water tank data you can estimate its arrival direction and its energy but you would also like to know what is the composition okay what type of cosmic ray they are detecting and that is done using fluorescence detection what is it now <clears throat> when an extensive air shower is produced in the atmosphere so initially the secondary multiplication happens it reaches a point where the shower reaches a maximum it means it has a maximum number of particles it's called shower maximum this is the point where it reaches maximum and then afterwards number of secondary production decreases okay now the charged particles in the shower they excite the nitrogen atom in the atmosphere and the nitrogen atom goes back to the ground state and they produce a fluorescence some kind of glow in the atmosphere i mean you cannot see in the naked eye but glow is produced that's in uv range <clears throat> now these photons can be detected so what they have they have in four counter four corners this kind of uh, detectors which has basically a mirror regular mirror so light enters through this window reflected in the mirror and then captured by this camera this camera is again made of photomultiplier tubes okay. but since this fluorescence happens and on the fluorescence it happens every time but it seems it's very faint you can only operate them in the nights okay. <clears throat> but how to determine the composition so what happens is suppose a proton comes now proton can penetrate deeper in the atmosphere and then initiate a shower okay whereas if an iron nuclei comes at the very top because it cannot penetrate very deep it will interact it has high interaction cross section so they will interact higher up 
So the shower maximum will happen at higher in the altitude. So from the measuring the glow, you can determine where the shower maxima happen. And from that, you can make a guess whether it's a proton or any heavier nuclear. That's how uh, this composition is determined. Okay, so next I move on from cosmic rays. So as I earlier said, like uh, in order to identify the sources, we need to detect gamma rays and neutrinos. So what are the mechanisms? How they are produced? So one example is a proton can interact with the matter and it can produce gamma rays and neutrinos from pi and decay. Neutral pi will produce gamma rays and charged pi will produce neutrinos. However, gamma rays can also be produced in other mechanism as well. So this is the pi zero decay you just said. Then there is a brain stirler. If a charged particle moves in the nuclear field, it produces radiation. And then if a charged particle is trapped in a magnetic field, it produces gamma ray via synchrotron radiation. And also by inverse Compton scattering, a charged particle can boost a low energy photon to high energy. Okay. So all these processes can produce gamma rays and we have detected gamma rays from many sources like supernova remnant pulsars, AGN, GRB, starburst galaxies. So they mostly produce either of this process. So since uh, <clears throat> I don't have much time, I'll only discuss this one source, AGN. What is an AGN? AGN is an active galactic nuclear. So <clears throat> like every galaxy has a black hole, we know that. Okay, recently you saw a nice picture by ASP. Okay. So if the galaxy has a supermassive black hole at the center, but only for a fraction of galaxies, this central black hole is active. It's activating mass from the surrounding. So this is the accretion disk with the black hole, and the particle jet is produced, which is perpendicular to the accretion disk on either side. Now it is believed, okay, or you now depending on how at what angle you're uh, observing the AGN, it will exhibit different properties. Now, if this jet is directly oriented towards us, suppose you are observing an AGN through this jet, then those AGNs are called blazers and at high energies, particularly for us who are looking for uh, high energy sources, these blazers are of particular influence because it is believed this, this charged particles are accelerated to very high energies in this jet. So we have detected many agents, many blazers rather, and we have detected blazers in all wavelengths, starting from radio, optical, UV, X-ray, even gamma rays. So if you combine all the data for a given AGM, and if you plot like this, energy in the x-axis and df by t, like flux per energy beam multiplied by energy square in y-axis, you will get this kind of double hole structure. Next, how do we explain this structure? So <clears throat> this red hump, it is believed, it's produced by the electrons. Electrons are trapped in the magnetic field in the jet and they produce synchrotron radiation, which I said earlier. And this hump can be explained, explained by this synchrotron radiation. This is more or less accepted. Then what happens about the second hump? There are multiple uh, options. One is, this synchrotron photons can be boosted by the same electron via inverse Compton scattering. Okay, and then in that case, the same structure will get shifted to higher energies, okay, inverse Compton scattering, or these electrons can uh, inverse Compton scatter other low energy photons coming from elsewhere, and we get this high energy emission. Now, we can explain whatever we observe only involving electrons or positrons, or in particle physics term, by electrons. Okay. If we do that, then the problem is, our idea is to identify sources of cosmic rays. And I said, cosmic rays are mostly protons and heavier nuclear. And then if we explain everything with electrons, then we cannot claim them to be source of cosmic rays. So then people came up with other models where they said, like along with electron, protons are also accelerated. Okay. So it may happen that first hump is still produced by the electrons due to synchrotron emission, but the second hump can also be produced or the gamma rays can be produced if proton interacts with matter and then pines are produced 
and neutral fine will decay and produce gamma rays. So if gamma rays are produced by uh, this neutral fine decay, then the shape will be slightly flatter. But when you analyze the data, it's not very easy to distinguish this kind of shape. Okay. In some sources, it's clearly seen, like in some supernova remnant or starboard galaxies, but particularly AGN is really tough. Okay. But if you can detect neutrinos from a source, because neutrinos can only be produced from the decay of charge pi, pi plus or pi minus. So if you detect neutrino, then you can claim with 100% certainty that this source is a source of cosmic rays. And it's true for any other source. If you detect neutrino, means it's also a source of cosmic rays. But if you only detect gamma rays, it may or may not. You cannot claim it 100% certainty. Why is the pi not in the or decay? Well, exactly, I cannot explain. I did not know. Well, but in, in inverse Compton, it's simply the shift of low energy. I'm to say that part is fine, but why pi zero is become flatter? I have to see. Yes. So next comes how do we detect gamma rays and neutrinos on ground? So like cosmic rays, neutrinos and gamma rays they also follow power law spectrum, meaning. At higher energies, we have very few of them, very few neutrinos per unit area per unit time, and very few gamma rays per unit area per unit time. Okay, so let's start with gamma rays. How can we detect gamma rays on ground? <clears throat> so, like cosmic ray, when gamma ray enters the top of the atmosphere, it interacts and it produces uh, electron positron pair. Then these pairs by Bremster and produces again gamma rays, and then gamma rays again produces pairs. A cascade or shower is developed in the atmosphere. It's called electromagnetic cascade. In case of cosmic ray, it has all kinds of particles, including its electromagnetic component. But for gamma ray, it only has electromagnetic component. Now, the charged particle, that is electron and positron present in this shower, will produce Cherenkov light because they move faster than light in the medium. And the Cherenkov light is spread over a very large area on the ground. So, if there was no atmosphere, the gamma ray would have hit here. But now, the secondary photons are spread over a very large area, meaning its effective area is increasing. Okay. And you can put a mirror anywhere in this light pool because this is just optical light, and you detect the Cherenkov photon. You can use a curved mirror and you put a PMT at the focus and you detect this Cherenkov photon and you detect the gamma ray. Now, how to select it? What kind of detector we should use? Again, in this case, we use PMTs. Why we need PMTs? So this is the distribution of Cherenkov photons and night sky background. So first of all, it's atmospheric, meaning we are using atmosphere as a medium. So these Cherenkov photons are produced in the atmosphere, and they are very, very faint. So look at this number and compare this with the night sky background number when there is no moon and no cloud. Here, moonless night. Okay, and look at this number and this number. So you need very sensitive detector. So PMTs are ideal for this. First of all, PMTs are sensitive in this wavelength, 300 to 400, where Cherenkov photons dominate. And they are also very fast because these Cherenkov flashes last only for a few nanoseconds. Okay, so if you have detector like CCD or other thing, which has microsecond exposure time, then you'll be adding up all the noises. So PMT is that the idea. So what a PMT does, it works on photoelectric effect. Whenever a chain of photon hits, even one single photon hits, it will eject an electron. Those electrons will produce few more electrons from these dynodes. And at the end, you will get an amplified electric signal from one photon. So if you look into oscilloscope, you will often see this kind of multiple peaks. Each of these peaks corresponds to one photoelectron. So four or five peaks means that PMT has detected four or five children of photons. <clears throat> okay, so this is how this, this is the basic technique. And the actual technique which is used to detect gamma ray, which is most successful, this is the imaging technique. What is that? So this is how the gamma ray shower produces in the atmosphere. So in this technique, people use a very large, large reflector of the order of 10 meters to 20 meters. This is just a mirror. And at the focal point, you put a cluster of PMTs, which act as a camera, like our cameras you have in mobile phone, 
although in mobile phone we have millions of pixels, but normally this camera as will have of the order of thousand PMPs. Okay, this, this small circles are PMPs. So normally they can watch four to five degree of the sky at a given point. So the charged particles are there in the shower, they are producing chain of light. These lights are reflected in the mirror and they're captured by this camera. So for a gamma ray shower, if you look at the image, it will appear elliptical in your camera plane. And when you're doing gamma ray astronomy, you need to know two things, the energy of the gamma ray and from which direction the gamma ray has come. Right? So the major axis of the ellipse will tell you from which direction the gamma ray has come. So this major axis is actually the axis of the gamma ray. And from the number of Cherenkov photons detected, like different color means each color represents a certain number of photons. So brighter red means that particular PMP has detected say 20 uh, photons. And fainter means it has detected say five photons. So add all the chain of photons, and this chain of photons, the number of chain of photons will tell you what is the energy of the gamma because it's proportional. Okay. So from the number of chain of photons, we know the energy, and from the this axis, we can estimate the arrival direction of the gamma. But when you do gamma ray astronomy, you also have to take care of the cosmic ray background. Okay. So earlier I said when a cosmic ray comes in, it produces a shower and it has charged particles, like I said, muons. Okay, but those muons are it will also have electromagnetic component which will have electron position. They also produce current of photons. For a uh, telescope, it cannot separate whether the current of photons is getting whether it's coming from a cosmic ray shower or from a gamma ray shower. And also you have to keep in mind, for one gamma ray shower, there is thousand cosmic ray shower. So when we I, when I talked about cosmic ray experiment, we didn't bother about any other background because it's too many. But here we have to be very careful. Okay, because we'll be dominated by cosmic ray shower and we have to eliminate that. How to do that? If you look at the image produced in the camera by a cosmic ray shower, which has a very irregular shape compared to a gamma ray shower. I mean it's not that simple of course. I'm just giving an example. So by looking at the image, one can determine whether it's a cosmic ray or a gamma ray. Image. And this imaging telescope, regular means what happens is, so this is how <clears throat> this is how the shower develops in the atmosphere, right? Now you, this is a gamma ray shower. This is very narrow, okay? But when a cosmic ray comes, it produces all kinds of particles. Each of these particles will have different different momentum. Yes, yeah. they get scattered. And the, so they are scattered and they are producing current of light. Right? So you get kind of an irregular shape. And electron and positron are not easily deflected. So they remain narrow. So you get a very regular shape. So this imaging telescopes, they can very efficiently identify the gamma ray against cosmic ray backlog. However, remember this imaging telescope, even though they are very good, they can only be operated at night, when there is no moon, no clouds, and they have, they can only watch four to five degrees in the sky, not more than that. So these are the current, hmm? why, why? Okay. because it depends on the camera size. The camera size says that it can only observe uh, four to five degrees in the sky. You can make it within the structure, it will become very, uh, I mean, you have to think about the structure, yes. I mean, it's 20 meter diameter and the focal, you can make only that big. If you make it very big, then there will be no balance. And this uh, PMP is really heavy. So <clears throat> these are the currently three imaging telescopes, MAGIC. Uh, they have 17 meter diameters, two telescopes. HES in Namibia, uh, this is in La Palma in Canary Island. This is a Namibian desert. They have 12 meter four and one very big 28 meters. And this is Veritas in Arizona. They also have 12 meter diameter this. They have done very well in the class for the last two decades. But now what they have decided, all these groups, let us combine all our resources and make much larger array. Okay. So the chain of telescope array is already started. So instead of one, there will be two arrays. Okay, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. The idea to have the two uh, arrays in two hemispheres 
to have the complete sky coverage because suppose we are interested in supernova remnants in the galaxy or galactic belt then we have to go to the southern hemisphere because from northern hemisphere we cannot access the galactic center and if you are interested only in agents and extra galactic sources then northern hemisphere is ideal that is one reason Second thing is, you can also notice like they are in two different time zones and they operate in night. So you can also increase your duty cycle. Like suppose this is observing one source and then at the night, and then when day breaks, you can start observing with this eye. So you can increase your duty cycle as well. Okay? And the expected sensitivity will be at least an order of magnitude more compared to existing telescopes. And each of these arrays, Okay, I'll just do one more thing. So one array will be at La Palma where magic telescopes are located and one array will be in Atacama Desert in Chile. <clears throat> so each array will have three types of telescopes. LST means large size of telescope for, to detect low energy gamma rays, medium size of telescope for the medium range and the small size of telescope for very high energy gamma rays. So, but as I said, like this imaging technique or atmospheric technique has a limitation. They can only be operated in the night and they have a small uh, sky coverage. So there is an alternative technique. It's called air shower technique. It's very similar to the cosmic ray experiment I said earlier. In this technique, instead of detecting Cherenkov photons produced in the atmosphere, what they do, they detect charged particles in the shower. Okay. So again, this experiment, Hawk, which is in Mexico, high altitude water chain curve, they use this kind of water tanks. They have a large array. So whenever electron positron passes through the water tank, they will produce chain curve light inside the tank. Now, since these tanks are light shielded, light from outside do not enter, and, and since you're detecting the charged particles, you can operate these telescopes to in, for intercept. That's one thing. Similarly, there is one uh, experiment in China. They use similar techniques. They also use a solid state detector, scintillators. And they also have a large sky coverage because a gamma ray can come from this side or this side. Okay, of the sky, you are observing all the time. Suppose you are uh, and, uh, doing research on GRBs, this, this kind of experiments are useful. Oh, okay. Because uh, if, if you're using imaging telescope, suppose we are observing source here and gamma ray happens here, GRB. So by the time you move, the GRB will be, it will disappear. <clears throat> but the downside is you can only detect very high energy gamma. Because if a low energy gamma ray comes, then the secondary charge particles will be absorbed in the atmosphere. So in this case, you can only detect very high energy gamma rays. In the last two years, both the experiments have detected some very high energy gamma rays, or they are called fever from. Okay. So they, they are uh, opaque to the light they are getting, yes. Yes. but electrons and positrons can easily penetrate. Yeah. Okay, so this is all about gamma rays. No, opaque means this is just a tank. So you, you make a tank, any normal tank, and you seal it from light. Like you just uh, put the cover, that's all. Then the light will not go in, but any other, uh, even high energy gamma ray can paint it. So, so in this, um, so your point was to come down from the background, the gamma ray to be from the topic. No, no, not we, we don't achieve cosmic reduction in this thing. This is to increase your duty cycle because in previous experiments, noise is there. In fact, so if you look at the image here, the cosmic ray elimination is not as efficient as imaging technique. Otherwise, it would have been very good. Because what happens here is because this charge particle for cosmic rays, they also have neons. Yes. Neon can really go very far. However, if, when you're looking for coincidences, because neon is something localized. So neon passes through, even if it passes through this room, it will produce light here. So if you're looking for coincidences between four or five tanks, then you can eliminate the neons. Mm -hmm. okay. But 
if you compare with imaging technique and this technique, the cosmic ray background elimination is not as efficient as in the imaging technique compared to this. Okay, so this is about gamma rays. So if you're interested in uh, knowing more about this technique, so recently I have edited uh, this issue where we have discussed all these uh, experiments in detail and all the sources which have been detected till now. And you can also go into this web page, the UVCAD. They normally record all details about every source. Next is neutrinos. Neutrinos is really very really fascinating. In fact, I can talk about neutrinos for hours, like four, five hours. But today I'll only uh, talk about a specific, uh, only astrophysical neutrinos. So neutrinos are plenty. Okay. Even as we speak, 68 million neutrinos are passing through our thumbnail even now. Just imagine how many are there. <clears throat> and none of them are interacting. So for neutrinos, we don't exist. They have almost zero mass, but not zero, definitely not zero. Why? Because when they travel, we know there are three kinds of neutrinos, electron neutrino, muon neutrino, and tau neutrino. But when they travel, the electron neutrino may become muon neutrino or a muon neutrino become tau neutrino like this. And this oscillation happens because they have mass. <laughs> They also hold the clue like why our universe is matter dominated because neutrinos and anti neutrinos behave differently and their detection is extremely difficult. No matter what energy a neutrino you want to detect, that's very, very difficult. <coughs> so, this is. That's the city violation phase. Just okay. on. So these are the various sources. We have uh, neutrinos from the relic, neutrinos from Big Bang. Okay. And then we have solar neutrinos, supernova neutrinos. Okay. But today, since this is the energy range I'm covering, so I'll talk about how to detect atmospheric neutrinos. These neutrinos are produced when cosmic ray enters in the atmosphere, it produces pines. Pines decay and produces neutrinos, and muon, the muon will also decay and produce neutrinos. Okay. These are atmospheric neutrinos. The neutrinos from astrophysical sources that I already explained. And these cosmogenic neutrinos. These are produced when a very high energy cosmic ray interacts with cosmic microwave type. But at very, very high energies, uh, the detection technique, which I'll explain, it's not really efficient. We actually, nowadays, we detect with radio, but that I'm not going to talk today. <clears throat> so for astrophysical neutron detection, there are two experiments which is operating currently, one ice cube, and other is antares. So here also, like one thing I missed for gamma ray experiment, cosmic ray experiment, as well as neutrino, one thing is common. So in, in the detection, we're using the Cherenkov method. So they produce charged particles. These charged particles produce chunk of light, which we detect using PM. Same thing happens for neutrino as well. Now, <clears throat> so since we are detecting chunk of photons, we need a transparent medium. So either ice or water, because we cannot use uh, atmosphere for neutrino because it's, I mean, it's very difficult. And for uh, neutrino, atmosphere means it's vacuum. Okay, it'll never interact. So we need ice or water, which is transparent, yet has some density. So this ice cube, they use uh, uh, ice in South Pole to detect neutrinos. And this experiment uses, uh, it's located in Megan in Singapore. So I'll talk about ice cubes since I work for them. So there is something unique about neutrino telescope and compared to any other telescope. Any, when I say any other telescope, because it's optical, radio, gamma ray, X-ray, anything. Suppose we, we have an optical telescope here okay, or a radio telescope. What we observe, we all observe souls in the sky above us. But for neutrino telescope, they observe sky, which is other side of the earth. Suppose we have a neutrino telescope in Calcutta. We'll be observing sky to tunnel through earth on the other side, sky on the other side. Why is that? Because I said at the beginning, we get cosmic rays isotropically from outside. Okay. And <clears throat> they produce muons. When they interact in the atmosphere, these muons. And these muons can penetrate 
cube kilometers underground. Okay, so we need to reduce the background. So you just look at the numbers. Even after applying that condition and putting the detector much inside the underground, like few kilometers, we still get 3,000 cosmic eons per second, which are not absorbed. And now look at the atmospheric neutrinos. It's one every five minutes. And we are interested this for this astrophysical neutrinos, we get one per month. Just imagine how huge is the background. So initially, the idea was one can use art as a filter. So there are cosmic rays are also coming from other side, but muons produced on the other side, they can only end, go up to a few kilometers. They cannot travel the entire arc, thousands of kilometers. So they will be absorbed. So if we, when we uh, determine the arrival direction, like suppose this is one neutrino coming, it produces muon or some other charged particle. The charged particle will go through the detector and produce Cherenkov light. So from this arrival time of these photons in different PMTs, we can estimate from which direction neutrino has come. So we know whether it's coming from below or above. And from number of chains of photons, we can estimate what is the energy of the neutrino. Okay. So <clears throat> in this case, so if we use arc as a filter, so only neutrinos we can detect. So if we when we reconstruct an event, and if it tells us it's coming from below, upcoming event, we know it's a neutrino event. It can be astrophysical or atmospheric, but not neon. And from above, it's most likely neon. That was the idea. That's why people went to South Pole. But now we have developed the offline technique to eliminate all the neons. Okay, what we do now, now suppose this neon, neon along its path, it will produce strength of light. So if you tell the PMTs which are at the boundary, if they detect light, then we will not accept that it because a muon is empty. So we will apply kind of anti-coincidence. If you detect light at the boundary, you eliminate. That's definitely muon. You accept event which starts inside the detector volume because that can only happen for a neutron. So it comes in, unless it interacts, it will not produce any light. If the interaction happens inside, then you accept. So we call them starting events. So this is the ice cube, how it looks like. I mean, you cannot see it, you just you can imagine. So there are 86 holes, okay, and then these strings are deployed in the ice, and this kind of glass spheres are deployed. They are put in a regular intervals. They're attached to the strings from 1.5 to 2.5 kilometers. And this bottom half is PMT, and upper half is all the electronics. And look at these numbers. Even when we drink uh, distilled water, we feel that it's very, like we are safe, it's very pure. It's not that pure. But if you look at this number, like if you can drink this, that is really very pure. <clears throat> Next, in neutrino, apart from knowing the energy and its arrival direction, you would also like to know the type of neutrino because there are three kinds. Okay, this is the <clears throat> Electronic family, electron, muon, tau, and corresponding neutrons. At very high energies, the energy range that I am talking, uh, neutrino exchanges either a W boson or a Z boson with the nucleus. And it will break the nucleus, and nucleus will then produce many different particles. <clears throat> so there, now suppose a muon neutrino comes in, and it exchanges a W boson, and it can produce a muon. Then the muon will pass through the detector, this blue are the basically PMPs. Okay, so, and it enters from this side. How do we know it enters from? So how do we know it enters from this side? Because this PMPs will see light first. That's why they're red. And they will see light later. So that's why they're blue. And we can fit this event. With a track. And in, if you look actual event this week, it will appear like this. So this kind of track events are really good when we are doing astronomy because you, we know from this event from exactly where a neutrino has come and at high energies, muon and the neutrino, they are collinear. Okay, like this. The muon and the neutrino will be almost collinear. 
So if we can determine the arrival detection of muon, we know the neutrino detection. And in case of muon, like as shown here, the neutrino can interact outside somewhere, not inside the detector. But the muon can still enter because at high energies, muon can travel tens and twenties of kilometers, 10, 20, 30, 40 kilometers, okay? And it can trigger the detector. So we get this kind of events uh, for new, new charge current, and we call it track. And for any other interactions, whether electron neutrino or tau neutrino, if they exchange W boson, or all neutrinos, if they exchange Z boson, we get this kind of cascade of spherical events. What happens here? The neutrino comes inside the detector, and suppose interaction happens. This is the interaction vertex. The nucleus is broken, and the charged particles they spread out isotropically in all directions. So in detector geometry, they appear this kind of spherical event. Now suppose the neutrino has, like say, one PV means ten to the power fifteen electron volt energy. Then this event will have spread of six hundred meters, and also six hundred meters. I mean. We should have like I don't know 10, 15 residency campuses to contain such event. It's such huge. Okay, so here, here, the muon it produces light very locally. So, so this is the path that muon follows. Only the PMTs adjacent to this line will see Cherenkov photons, and the PMTs far will not see. But in this case, the particles that produced from a point is spread out. Okay. So that's why we see uh, this kind of cascade event. Okay. But this kind of events, arrival direction is non proved. I mean, they have an angular accuracy of 10 degrees. I mean, if we say any other telescope, we follow up a cascade event, they deny it straight away. I mean, if you ask a radio telescope with 10 degree resolution, they say no. But since they have very good energy resolution, for us, that's a good info. Uh, I mean, information because sorry, I'm this way. So here, so atmospheric neutrinos, they can uh, be up to a few hundreds of PV. So suppose you want to reconstruct an event, and if you see that event has around this energy range, then we know for sure it's an astrophysical because there is we do not expect any background. Here. So energy information is really crucial. Okay, so this is about uh, event topology. So Ice Cube has seen last 10, 12 years, many such events okay, distributed all over the sky, but only one event would be associated with one laser, PXS. And how do we know that this the source is emitting neutrino? So what happens is, Whenever Ice Cube sees a very high event, immediately it sends a telegram to all telescopes across the globe. Okay. So they found this on this date, 12th of July, and they sent the telegram. Then all telescopes followed that event. And since it is a muon event, it had an angular res resolution of fraction of a degree. So they followed, and many telescopes found some excess event from this source. So from coincidence, we claim. That even we have seen, and likely it's also coming from that particular that one. Event. But since it's one event, of course, people will ask question. One event, I mean, I mean, it can be anything, right? Then we realize that if we want to detect or to establish that this is a neutrino source, we should detect at least two mu neutrino events because if we get cascade event, then angular resolution is when information is uncertain. So we need to detect two muon neutrino events at least. So in order to detect two muon neutrino events, we have to wait for at least 20 years with current size of ice cube, which is one cubic kilometer. So the plan is, next plan is to make it bigger. You make it at least 10 times bigger. So this is the current size of tele ice cube telescope. So the plan is to make it much bigger. And at present also, there is a surface array exists, which is used for measuring cosmic rays, and also to tag muons which are going in. So they also have a plan to make a much larger array okay, for improvement of statistics. So I think work has started. So hopefully in next 10 years, we'll have more neutrino sources as the expectations. Okay?
they'll come to end. So there is a book where you can find all the details, diction techniques and uh, some high energy astrological If you're interested, you can look at it. So thank you. The discussion on this book with Anand Narayan Sahar. Yes, sir. He was the he was in the editor. The editor board. Yes, sir. That's very nice. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Okay, I'm going to. So, sir, you were talking about the related effects to the topic here. So, you spoke about. No, it's not me. You were talking about the picture of Gamma. Yeah, so you spoke about the axis which can give us an idea about the which in this direction. So, is it so? How can we comment on the axis? So, generally, like if you. This is how the Savart table does. You need to make a projection on the camera plane. It will look like an ellipse. But then if you project it, you can see this major axis is bound to be this axis. Like if there was an atmosphere, the gamma would have traveled in this line. Okay. If this is the line represented by this major axis. You just make a projection in the camera plane. Two D projection. <laughs> Okay, thanks for the nice talk. So I just had a question like you know, earlier you talked about, talked about like uh, we consider like electron and electronic models for you know, the blazers, but if there is a neutral detection, then we say that okay, then there must be total activity. So say we you know that neutral that we detected from a source. So then like can we somehow comment on like how much of the particle population is left on and how much of that also you can do. There are models and you can do the details analysis. I mean, it can be both left to hadronic. Part of uh, emission comes from leptons, part of emission comes from proton as well. That is an issue. Okay. But if you find neutrino, then it's a definite proof for cosmic rays. I mean, it may tell various things about the source, but we are interested in knowing if, whether it's a source of cosmic ray or not. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the nice talk. So, I have a question that uh, if you think about the cosmic neutrino background, then uh, the cosmic neutrino background. I think it's talking about the relic neutrino. Uh, relic neutrino, okay. Uh, the energy of that neutrino is very small. Very small. And, uh, yeah, so, yeah. for the current uh, ice cube neutrino, I have to forget, forget about ice cube. There is no other, but for to detect such low energy neutrino, you need very different uh, techniques. Even for uh, neutrinos coming from sun, or supernova, they are not, uh, ice cube is not suitable because they have much lower energy. So for that, like, I'm currently associated with a experiment called hyper -sanyo -sanyo. They detect uh, solar neutrinos or supernova neutrinos at any the energy. So this I'm talking about TV, hundreds of TV, PV, such high energy neutrinos. The low energy is near impossible. Okay, I have a question. Okay, I didn't get so uh, these, uh, the and these, uh, the and the oh, they can, they can, as I said, like, suppose if this energy is less than 10 to the electron volt, it will remain trapped for whatever the escape time, 10 to the 14 seconds. And in during that time, it will gain energy continuously. And at some point, it will escape because then its gyro radius will be larger than the size of galaxy itself. Then it will escape. Seven, yes. So it will change, that's what we measure. Actually, if you look very closely, the, it's not continuously point, to the power minus two point, it changes. There is a, uh, so there is slight change in here. It's called knee region. 
Okay, so it's it has certain slope up to here. It changes here, and we generally believe that slope changes because these are mostly produced in our galaxy. And these are mostly coming from extra galaxy. So slope is slightly different. Though on an average, we can say it is by minus two point seven. It here also it slightly changes. We call it angle, but for an average, like if you take the entire spectrum, it's you can say it's two point seven. <clears throat> you have a question? Uh, sir, uh, you explained about the nucleus effecting from dark matter, the nucleus from the dark matter. So, is it possible this nucleus could be a component of the dark matter uh, structure forming things? Maybe. I mean, for me, I just detect nucleus. Okay. And then I can identify if I see, and if you tell me what are the likely dark matter sources. And if I, when I analyze them, if I find out okay, the least nucleus, you know, could be associated with that source, then I can say maybe it's uh, related to dark matter. Then that's what I do. I mean, I don't know exactly the dark matter. Can nuclear be like 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 a constituent dark matter? Well, the answer so far is no, as far as yes. pathological uh, experiments go. We can discuss that later. But yeah, if there is something called a warm dark matter, sterile nuclear, so that. Some people try to connect that part to there, but not the uh, the the nucleus that generally the sterile nucleus is talk about longer. Maybe just the two things I would like to mention for the students. Like today I discuss like cosmic rays and all related astrophysics, but there is also practical application for cosmic rays. So recently I started a work. I'll just quickly mention. So this, uh, when a cosmic ray interacts, okay, it, it produces many, many muons. Okay, it's there down. So we're going to use those muons to study the volcanoes. So normally, like when we have some, like uh, something is fractured that happens, we go for X-ray. Now, if you want to study a volcano, you need to do an X-ray, exactly what's there inside. How to do that? These muons can be used. Not that volcanoes even for any big structures. Like if you search in Google, like people have studied pyramids using neons, and they found their chambers which were not expected. Similarly, we can also use neutrinos to study what is there at the center of our arc. Okay, like neutrinos goes through entire arc. So geophysicists they are trying to say like what is the composition of the inner arc. And you cannot do it because you cannot build 10,000 kilometers. Neutrinos, I said, they oscillate. Now, this oscillation probability depends on the matter which is there at the in inside the arc. Its electron density changes with the different composition. And as a result, electron oscillation will change. So if you can measure oscillation effect, you can determine the core composition of arc. So these are the practical applications we can do cosmic rays or neons and neutrons. Great. So any other questions? Um, okay, Patada, then it is. So very nice talk to them, but I have to give a nice question. So at the initial, the initial stage, you made the distinction between cosmic rays, which are composed of protons, particles, and gamma rays and neutrons, which are very electrical neutrons. But then the question is, suppose we're looking at uh, some very distant galaxy like M87, and then you see these particles, whatever they are, irrespective of what their nature is, and they pass close to Sagittarius in the sky. What about the effects of gravity? It's going to deflect all of it. So there, there are these, I mean, gravitational lensing, but not sure what parts there. Well, I think, I don't know, maybe this, uh, this slow energy, I don't think they're affected by the gravitational field. No, I don't think. Oh, I don't know. It's, it's very really yeah, yeah, I don't know. effect, I don't know. I mean, we never, it should, uh, it should be there, but it's. I mean, they could be deflected away just like, you know, I don't know any of 
study where they do it like that. No, I was saying that that really depends on what we are trying to look at. I mean, if we are just looking, you know, if we are so, I think we speak about gravitational lensing when uh, we are trying to look at the sun and the light is coming from there and it's, and it's lens. But, but here, I guess, neutrinos is coming from an astrophysical source. And yeah, there will be gravitation that it will be affected by gravity. No doubt about that. It will be affected by gravity. But um, the question is that why would that reflection by gravity be relevant here? And then you have to also see. No, okay, but for charged particles, that even if they're deflected, we will know. We will never know because they're deflected by any other things. So, gamma ray and neutrino, we don't see any gravitational effects as such. Yeah. So much of the that we don't get to see them. That's probably the question about. I see. Okay. Yes. That point you were talking about uh, relation at which you are paying degree. No, gamma rays are detected with such activity. Gamma rays are detected with high activity. Two arc seconds. observe in this technique how the shower develops in the atmosphere. Even though you need to point your telescope towards the source, but you basically you can capture the image of the shower in the atmosphere. Also, <clears throat> for normal telescope, your source is perfect to figure out Here your source is a figure yeah. But you don't need to be very sensitive. So that, that's not so sensitive, 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 sensitive with you. Yes, but I mean, you don't need to be, I don't know, not as that much. No, that much is not needed. But what you need, like normally, optical telescope use CCD. Hmm. Here you cannot use CCD because CCD has a large norm. Yes, but, so PMT takes care of the rest of the thing. <clears throat> So um, one thing that uh, you said that you will need 20 more years to detect another 20 event. years in average to yeah. detect two neon neutrino events from a source. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that uh, I'm sure you know this, uh, but just in general, 
that uh, particular done after this discovery mm. of uh, neutrino event coinciding with some pairing in, in a nearby data. Mm. If people have looked back at previous neutrino events, yes. and they have found three more cases where there was a neutrino event and the nearby data also there. Yes. So now people look at those players, so those data. Yes. So people do this kind of setting as setting analysis. But still, like I would say, it's you, you should wait. I mean, so there, are, uh, yeah, it's all right. statistics how you are interpreting data. Then that's right. I mean, in a couple of cases, they did not find any, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but in two or three cases, they like did for that particular source, they are found. No, it's not sources, events, it's events, events, but people also do sources okay. like all, all AGNs and all GRBs you stack, and I mean, in. Stacking means you know the JV directions, so you see events and then try to match because you know what would be the background distribution. And if you see excess, then you say some of them could be, but you cannot pinpoint a particular source in that. Yeah. And the other thing is a slightly sad state of affairs that I guess you should just mention in terms of uh, again the basic knowledge. Uh, I think India actually was uh, were to, uh, quite ahead. Then other countries, definitely for neutrino, detecting high energy governance. Even neutrino, even cooler gold field, they detected neutrino. Right. If they had reported, they would have also got Nobel Prize for the first detection. I mean, but then uh, all these other research, I think what they did was they concentrated on the air shower technique, whereas more progress happened in yeah, the so atmosphere and those So, right now, BSC is building one. So, it no, no. has been put, it is working. You are talking about MIN. I right? don't know if it is working or not. It's so, there. I just had a talk from a representative of MIN in a, in a conference in August. And he said that, uh, I mean, he showed some, um, some detections and some simulations. I mean, it's not that basically they're looking at crab and they are trying to improve their simulation. Yeah, they're also claiming many things we have doubts. <laughs> Yeah. Anyway, so there is a, a sort of high energy gamma telescope in, in Ladakh that has sort of started working, but it's not it's not yet. It's okay. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, Sir, so you so the inner detector will be eight to ten cubic kilometers. But they will also have some radio antenna. So at area energy, the secondary particles, instead of ten of photons, they also produce radio at Asterian So that is that is on the surface of the hey, you don't have to go very deep, maybe a couple of meters in the ice. Even the radio detectors. Mm, even the radio detectors, like you need that because you will be aiming for neutron before inside the eyes. Okay. Uh, if there aren't any other questions, oh, there's a question from Shubhashish. Yes. So uh, I have just a little question uh, that you mentioned in the last that. Uh, mm. The prospect has some direct applications, like you mentioned about the data or something. Um, so is there any type of study has been done on uh, that how this prospect is effect on human life or in medical science? Like, uh, may, not not cosmic rays, but charged particles. It, people use this accelerator, like even the data level, they use a particular accelerator to cure cancer. So you know that how a charged particle can be accelerated, you apply that same mechanism here, but it's not energy. So actually, in almost all space missions where things are going above atmosphere, if we try to send, uh, I mean, uh, and like sort of human-like materials, so polymers and waves like Marco, they send that in those places have to see how that is affected by both cosmic ray and other things in the in space. Because, you know, Artemis 1 will be launched, then after 20 years, humans will be launched in the not 1970s anymore, but it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, if there aren't any other questions, let's hand the speaker. Thank you. Have a nice talk.